All right, y'all, it is great to be with you tonight. Um, I am excited to be back. If you saw me blazing in here really quickly, it is because I w woke up in North Carolina this morning. Um, that wasn't an accident, by the way. I've been there for a few days. <laughs> Hence the coffee. Hence the coffee. Um, <laughs> uh, I, w I was in North Carolina. I was at a, a preacher thing, and, and that was kind of fun. Um, uh, the most fun part of it, though, was running this morning in the mountains in 70-degree weather. And then I came here. Um, as soon as the plane landed, I got out of it and was like, oh, <laughs> welcome back to hell, literally. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love Alabama. The heat has got to go. Amen? amen. Yeah, amen. We're there. We're there. Uh, but hey, we got a game Saturday <laughs> in the dead heat of, of the sun, so that, that'll be fun. Uh, play for four, stay for four. Get those loyalty points. Hey, before we get going, um, I, I've got to say this because I say it every single week. If you are not yet enrolled in our Bible reading plan for the semester, what are we? Day 15 starts tomorrow? Day 15, is that right? It's going to be great. You can start on day 15. Shoot, you can start on day 14 if you want to do it tonight. But listen, as I said last week, some of you didn't get this. You thought I was being literal. Abs are made in the kitchen. And your faith is made in your quiet time with the Lord, right? Okay? Okay, some of you don't get that still. I'm going to keep saying it because we, we, we're going to get whole, we're going to get swole, you know what I'm saying? So uh, tonight, tonight though, um, we, we are continuing in a series. Before we get into tonight's thing, I also got to give a couple of other shout outs. First of all, our Frisbee team. You guys, oh my God. Who'd you beat? Who'd you beat? We beat Bama Catholic. Y'all, they're good. Y'all, y'all, they're good. They're good. They're so good. So anyway, our Frisbee team plays on Tuesday nights. If you want to like get hype with them, go and see them. It's either 6 or 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights. We don't know until like the day of or the day before or whatever. But anyway, super excited about that. Second of all, this past Saturday, we had a group that went to help uh, clean up the city, right? Uh, we, we had some people participate in some cool good deeds. Uh, uh, picking up trash, y'all got like sweet vests where you went and like helped clean up the city. I only saw some pictures off of Instagram, but um, man, uh, helping people are happy people, right? Uh, that there are some smiling faces. Look like they had a great time. If you want to know uh, more ways to get involved in, in how to help uh, make Tuscaloosa great, but also uh, you know do cool things across this campus as well for the benefit of others to spread the kingdom of God, you can talk to our outreach intern. That is Will. Will give a wave right over there. Uh, dressed very professionally in the khakis tonight, uh, by the way. So. Looking good, Will. Um, anyway, th those are those were a bunch of things going on. But like I said at the beginning, I'm just glad to be with you tonight. If you are new here tonight, I'm Wade. I'm the campus minister here. Um, I am super super glad that you're here with us. I'm not going to call you out or what, whatever, but I just wanted to say, hey, introduce myself. And now I'm going to talk at you for a little bit, if that's okay. Um, and I'm playing. I am going to talk, but I, I'm talking at you. Anyway, we are uh, in week three of a series that we're calling Illusions. An illusion is a, a distraction or a mirage or it's uh, something that, that um, essentially distorts the reality. And there are things in life that distort the reality, the God's good reality for our lives. Sometimes we call those things temptation. Sometimes we call it sin. Uh, whatever you call it, we're calling it illusions during the course of this series. And, and for the last couple of weeks, we've talked about some things that are illusions in our lives. The illusion of identity. How sometimes we put up false identities for others to see. Not just your finsta, but your life finsta as well. Like your, the, what you are giving to the world. Um, that, that, that isn't your true self, God-given self. Uh, last week, we talked specifically about temptations and how temptation and sin is a distortion of God's good desires that God has given to us. And sin is really, it's essentially the idea that we are satisfying God-given desires without God. Temptation and sin comes about when we satisfy God-given desires apart from God. You with me? 
Okay, so tonight we're moving into a brand new distortion, a brand new illusion, and it is the illusion of meaning. It's the illusion of career. It's the illusion of what you are here for. And so tonight, I want to ask you a couple of questions. What on earth are you here for? I don't mean Wesley. I mean on this planet. What on earth are you here for? What are you passionate about? And to use spiritual terminology, what is your calling? What is your calling? So tonight, I'm going to look at Luke chapter 5. We're going to bounce around just a little bit. But in Luke chapter 5, we get this classic scene of Jesus calling his first disciples. Here's what it says. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Well, he got into one of them, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water, let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break, and so they signaled to other partners in the boat to come and help them, and and they came, and they filled their boats so full that they began to sink in their boats. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. May God add blessing to this, the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. Uh, Pastor and theologian John Piper tells this interesting story um, several years ago where um, he talks about this this, this, uh, article in Reader's Digest where he he reads that there was this married couple that is living the dream. They have just retired to this beach home and they spend their days, and the article says this, they spend their days walking up and down the beach and they collecting seashells. And then at night, they'll sit on their porch and they'll admire their seashell collection. And he says, is this the dream? Then he talks about two missionaries in a third world country who were tragically killed um, that, in a bus crash, a bus accident. Struck down seemingly in, in, in the prime of their life and the prime of their mission. And he said, these two things... One would call this bus accident of these missionaries a tragedy. He said, but which one is the real tragedy? Which of these two accounts is the real tragedy? He said, if the dream of your life is walking up and down a beach in retirement collecting seashells, that's the tragedy. Because the true purpose and meaning in life is a lot more than seashells. And he even goes so far to say as, when we all get to heaven, what do we show the Lord? Do we show him the seashell collection? <laughs> Look what you made, God, I got him. <laughs> what do you show the Lord? And so I ask you this question, what are you here on earth to do? To put it another way, what are you here at the University of Alabama to accomplish? What is your ultimate goal? Sometimes we couch that in a major, but I'm not interested in majors. What do you want to do in life? What excites you? What's the thing that you want to do once you get this degree? Jesus seems to know that we want more than just accomplishments. We want more than just a degree. And deep down, we want more than just seashells. Jesus goes up to these fishermen, and he kind of hijacks their boat, and he tells them where to go with it, and um, he, he uh, takes over their fishing expedition, as a matter of fact, telling them, these professional fishermen, where to throw their nets and stuff, and at the end of it all, he says to them, 
follow me. In fact, if you look in Matthew's gospel, there's not even this moment where he's teaching in the boats. He literally just comes up to the fishermen and he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. And they leave their nets and they go, to which I always thought was weird, right? I always thought that was an odd thing. Like this stranger Jesus shows up and, and says, hey, fishermen, want to like travel with me for three years? And they're like, totally, let's do that. Two even leave their father's business, James and John. They're like, okay, sorry, Dad, bye, Zebedee. And Jesus, she's like, hey, come on. And, 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 and Zebedee is probably like, who is this guy that just stole my workers and my sons from me? Got kind of a weird thing. Luke gives us a little bit more insight. Jesus has done some teaching. But even so, like one sermon, and you're like, okay, that's weird. It doesn't even tell us what he preached on this day, Right? But there is something different about Jesus. Where does a calling come from? Where does that desire, that passion to make a difference in the world come from? For the disciples, here's what I think. That teaching that happens at that, uh, on both sides, or actually at the boat, because he's preaching from the boat, which is a cool idea. I've never done that. That would be neat. Um, that's an echo of a, a sermon, I believe, that happened in chapter 4. So I actually want to go to chapter 4 to talk about the, the substance of Jesus' first sermon. Why? Because I think that in Jesus' first sermon in chapter 4 of Luke, we get an insight into the vision that Jesus is casting. Because here's what I believe about calling. Calling begins with a passion. Calling begins with a vision that is cast, and you're like, I want to be in on that. Jesus casts a vision and instills passion in people in chapter 4. Here's what he says. Oh, excuse me. Chapter, 14, uh, chapter 4 of Luke, verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. Why was it spreading about him? That's a good question. Because, like, there wasn't YouTube. He did, it wasn't going viral or anything. How does a spoken word, you're not literally going to go out of here and be like, oh my gosh, Wesley, let's spread the word of Wesley all throughout this campus tonight. I mean, it's going to be cool. We're, we're really excited and the Holy Spirit's here and all that stuff. But, like, there's something different when Jesus was, was doing this. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. It says that he went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. Now listen to this. This is key. He reads the scriptures. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolls up his scroll, gives it back to the attendant, and he sits down. And everyone's eyes in the synagogue are fixed on him. He began, began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now that is a way to start a sermon. Because he reads the scripture, and he says, Not the word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God, or what I do, may God add blessing to this, the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. But instead, he sits down and he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled. I mean, that is a way to start a sermon. You don't need a catchy video. You don't need a band. It's just like, boom, what I just read, it's happening. And what did he just read? That there is going to be good news for the poor. And so anybody that was poor there that day, they're like, what? Is it fulfilled for me? There's going to be freedom for the prisoners. And I imagine that people there were saying, but that, that could be me too. I'm, I'm, I'm the one that's in prison. Is, is that right for me? There's recovery of sight for the blind. There's the, the freedom for the oppressed. And then there's the year of the Lord's favor. And you've got to believe that people are like, I've heard this before. I've heard this. Yeah, these are the empty promises of Scripture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard this before. I've prayed that prayer. And Jesus says, today, that cry of your heart is fulfilled. And Jesus sets a course, a trajectory for his three years of ministry to do just that. Do you realize that Jesus wasn't just about teaching? Jesus wasn't just about telling people, this is good theology and that's bad theology, uh, you know, nod to the Pharisees. He wasn't just into that. 
His deal, his mission statement is about freedom. It's about good news. It's about recovering what is lost. In fact, if you go back to the original passage in Isaiah 61, it actually has this, this, uh, this in invocation of, uh, of the idea of the hemorrhaging heart and that the one that comes in the name of the Lord will bind up the hemorrhaging heart. And you've got to believe that people that are hearing this, they're like, uh, okay, I never thought that that could be for me, but what if this guy is it? And if that's the message that he's sharing in that first boatside conversation with the disciples, you better believe there's something there. Because when I hear that, I'm like, Jesus, like, I, I want to do that. I want in on that. I want to bring good news to the poor. I, I want to bring freedom where there are captives. I want to be a part of being a world changer, a difference maker. I want to be the kind of person, be a part of a movement that's bigger than me, that's bigger than my degree. And that's where passion begins to well up in us. In fact, I, be I believe, I actually bet that you caught some sense of passion as you were thinking about what you wanted to do in life, what major you wanted. Now, for some of us, we say, well, you know, this major is good because I'll have a lot of money. But why do you need a lot of money? Well, maybe it's to take care of your family that you hope to have one day. But maybe it's more than that. I have this belief that calling begins with passion. And if the disciples, the, or excuse me, the soon-to-be disciples, the fishermen, are like hearing this, they're tending their nets, he's, he's obviously good at fishing, even though he didn't major in it or whatever, like Jesus, the fishermen are just like, wow, he's better at this than us, we just thought he was a teacher, he's, he's cool though, like, this is awesome. They're pulling in the nets and stuff, and then all of a sudden, it's like, this guy is passionate, he's also pretty cool with fishermen, I'm, I'm into this. And then what does he say to them? He says, follow me and I will make you fish for people. There's a philosopher uh, known as Pierre Bordeaux. Pierre Bordeaux, um, without going into all of his different theories, he has this idea um, or, or uh, proposal that says that we are all um, given a degree of cultural capital. And our goal in life, as far as influence in the world, is we are trying to build up cultural capital. You might say, well, what is cultural capital? Capital is essentially value, right? It's some sense of, of, uh, of value or worth. Cultural capital is broken into two things. I'm going to get into lecture professorial mode for just a second, so bear with me. I'm coming to a point here. Cultural capital is broken up into two things. On the one hand, you've got economic capital. What is economic capital? Money, Money yeah. But to, 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 to bring it up to a little bit of a higher viewpoint than that, Economic capital is anything of worth or value that other people might want or find desirable or useful. So it could be money, it could be cash, it could be ruples, it could be chickens, okay? It could be anything of value that you say um, is, is uh, you know, that, that, that someone else says that's something that I want. Know what else it could be beyond money? It could be talents, abilities, skills, even a degree, it's something that you are able to contribute a value to an organization, a society. So on the one hand, we've got economic capital. Now, on the other hand, we have social capital. Now, what is social capital? Friends, it's your connections. Have any of you ever gotten a job because someone you knew knew someone? Yeah? Some of you have gotten jobs because you knew, knew a guy or your mom knew a guy or something like that. That is using social capital, right? It's using networks to gain some influence through that. Now, did you deserve it? Eh, probably not. But the connections were good. And especially at this point in your life, I mean, I hate to be so blunt about this, but your social capital is kind of limited, but not as limited as your economic capital, right? Right? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's why we go to cookout. 
It's not because of the food, y'all. It's because that economic capital. We got to wait. One day we're going to get a steak or real meat or something that doesn't come with a side of quesadilla. <laughs> One day we'll get to eat a lot nicer. But for now, we're leaning heavily into that social capital. You with me? And so Jesus comes up to these fishermen He's like, okay, fishermen, you're the ones that I'm going to choose to bring my movement. What's your movement? You, my movement is to bring freedom to captives. It's to bring good news to the poor. And they're like, I am so in. And then in Jesus' big job interview for the people that would one day lead his church, he says, so what skills do you offer? And they're like, we're fishermen. And he's like, that's what I want, which is bonkers. Because economic capital and social capital bring cultural capital, mean there is a potential for cultural influence. Jesus wants to influence the culture in a way that changes the world, that brings freedom to captives, sight to the blind, to make the lost found, and Jesus chooses those with significantly low cultural capital. Hilarious. <laughs> so why did Jesus choose fishermen? Well, I could answer this question, but a few years ago I did a series called Fishing Trip uh, where I went on a fishing trip with my brother who makes money as a bass fisherman. He wins a lot of tournaments. It's also how I found my dog, how he found my dog, and then I, the hero, saved the dog because Garrett wanted to euthanize him because Garrett is not a hero, but Garrett is a fisherman. Anyway, a few years ago I go on a fishing trip with him and I ask him this question and I film it and I say to him, uh, Garrett, um, <clears throat> why do you think Jesus chose fishermen? Let's take a look at the video. Why do you think that Jesus picked fishermen to start his church? Because they're patient. They had to be dealt. You know, they, they'd go days, weeks without being successful. Months, seasons. Um, they're able to stay confident, stay positive in what they're trying to do. They have a vision. They know sooner or later things will turn around. Um, that's, I mean, that's my thought. I mean, I'm not sure if he ever told a reason why. What helps you stay patient? Winning. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thought of winning, the thought of It's still, I mean, it's just fun. I mean, it's, it's better than sitting at home or doing something else, in my opinion. I mean, I'm out here on Saturdays, and I, you know, part of my job is to coach football, and, you know, I love football, but I will come out here a lot of Saturdays and miss football, football games, and, you know, that's almost considered a crazy in Alabama, you know, when you're an Alabama fan, but like a couple of weeks ago, I didn't come to the Alabama game, I had tickets, and decided to go fishing instead. So, I mean, it's not part of it. All right. So, my brother, uh, he, he's fishing, and then I ask him this question, why fishermen? And he says, because they're patient. What keeps you patient? He says, it's the thought of winning, and it's just fun. He loves catching fish. I learned so much from him, not just about fishing that day, though I did learn some things about fishing. I learned a lot about Jesus hanging out on the boat with my brother that day. First of all, we started real early, like before the sun or God got up. And we went fishing, and, Je uh, and Garrett, not Jesus, <laughs> Garrett said, Garrett <laughs> said, and Garrett said, you know, like, on the one hand, this isn't much of a struggle because I know that's when I'm going to catch the most fish. He, talk, he talked about hitting every post under a dock. He said there could be a fish there. There could be a fish here. There could be a fish somewhere that somebody else hasn't figured out. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what if we had that drive when it came to spreading the kingdom of God in the world? What if that was my mentality and not just like, oh, well, I'm supposed to do it because Jesus gave us the great commission. And I'm supposed to share my faith. Um, instead, what if I was like, no, it's the best thing in the world. I'll miss Alabama foot football for it. Wow. Um, I, that, that's amazing. But that's the kind of personality that Jesus sees in these fishermen. And he says, these are the ones. 
These are the ones. What is their cultural capital? Uh, they don't have a very high social standing, but they've got something of value, an economic capital that's more than money. It's something uh, of the kind of personality of a fisherman. So I ask you, what is your major training you to be and to do? If you're an engineer, what is that teaching you? For some of you, it's some tedious work. For some of you, it's a sense of just continuing, even though you hit a wall or you don't understand it. You keep trying and trying and trying, and you keep asking questions, and it develops some grit in you. Here's the thing. Whether you're an engineer or someone in the humanities, God has a calling over your life. When I was in college, uh, just a little, um, I, I guess I was a bit, I guess a junior at this point. I was in a church, and I was the youth director there, and every Sunday morning I would sit um, in, in the, the pews, and I would listen to the sermon, and there was this woman in, in the church, 95 years old, and at least once a service, sometimes more than that, from the very last pew, because that's where she sat, like her family bought the pew or something like that, and she, so she felt... Anyway, she would interrupt the sermon, and she'd go, Preacher! Preacher! And that's exactly how she would talk. She'd, like, stand up, Preacher! And he's, like, making a third point. I mean, we're going to wind it out. We might actually get to the buffet before other churches. But nonetheless, Preacher! And she would always say, We've got guests here. We need to welcome them. It's something ridiculous. But the part that drove me crazy was the fact that she's yelling up at the, the pastor and saying, Preacher! Preacher! Why did that bother me? Well, part of it for me is the fact I wanted to look at her and say, girl, that's the pastor. We're all the preachers. Every one of us is a preacher. But for so many of us, when it comes to church, we think that the professional Christian's job is to do the preaching. But I tell you, that's a lie straight from hell. The truth is, you're the preacher. I'm the pastor. Some of you may sense a call to ministry, and that is wonderful and glorious. But I pray to God that more of you than not will go into the secular world and give your life for the sake of the kingdom and for Jesus wherever you go. Because let me tell you this, I, we don't need more professional Christians. I'm just, I, boy, don't call the bishop. We don't need more professional Christians. What we need are solid kingdom-minded, God-honoring, good, loving, gracious Christians to go and be engineers and teachers and people in the work world. We need people to flood classrooms and the government. Okay? We need, and not the kind of people, not the kind of lawyers that are just like, on my signature, I have a little fish. No, it's like I am a Christian and I'm going to live according to these values. And I'm going to, in my little profession of law, or as an attorney, or as a doctor, or as a fisherman, or whatever it is, I'm going to make Jesus the forefront. And I'm not going to like preach him all the time, because I, I, I'm going to live his life and continue his mission, because I'm going to bring good news everywhere I go. I'm going to bring life where there is death. I'm going to bring sight where there is blindness. The truth is, when you get passionate about that and you pair that with your cultural capital, then God will offer opportunities to meet the world's needs. What's the need in the world right now that you care most about? What's the thing that breaks your heart when you see it on your feed, news feed, Twitter, whatever? When you see this thing happening in the world, you say, that's not right. What's the thing that deep down in your heart, you think to yourself, this is not acceptable? This would not happen in heaven. Because let me tell you the truth, folks. If, there, if it's not acceptable in heaven, it's not acceptable here. Being a Christian in the world around us is more than just wearing a Christian t-shirt. It's more than just like having a Bible verse on, on, on your business card. It's the day in, day out grind of bringing the kingdom. Jesus called fishermen to bring people into the kingdom. What might God call you to be doing through your major, through your life? 
Now, your career may not be your ministry. It may not be your ministry. It may be a means for your ministry. What do I mean? A buddy of mine, I was talking to him just this week. He said, uh, so I, um, a couple years ago, I was in need of a brand new um, uh, finance chair in my church, which is a super important part of the church. So he said, obviously, I start looking for all of the people that might be good finance chairs in, in, in my church. And lo and behold, there was a president of a bank in my church. And so I went to him, and I was like, I'm going to take him out to lunch. We're going to have a very nice lunch. I'm going to really... So he's basically kind of given him a, a little bit of a pitch. What are you excited about? What are you good... Like, Let's talk shop a little bit. Oh, how's the bank world going? A, a pastor trying to talk about that, whatever. Um, he, he's like, well, so tell, tell me all this stuff. And, and the guy uh, eventually, uh, he's talking about work. And the pastor says to him, so what, like, what do you want to do? Like, what do you feel like God's stirring you to do? And the guy said, you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to teach kids about Jesus. And he was like, what? Because the pastor was about to ask, hey, would you like to be my finance chair? But then he's stuck with this. He's like, so what, 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 what do you envision yourself doing? He said, is there any way that I could teach Sunday school to like elementary kids or even middle schoolers, which is a sainthood moment? Um, <laughs> And so the pastor said, well, actually, we are, we're looking for a first grade Sunday school teacher. Why don't you give it a shot? He's been teaching that Sunday school class for the last two years and killing it. The kids love him, and he's the finance guy. But in his mind, he's like, that gives me a means, but there's things that I'm passionate about. And if, 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 if Building a life over here to free me up so I can do this thing that energizes me and charges me, that's all the better. There's a wonderful relationship between our ministry and the way it affects our careers. And I think that we see that again and again. Of course, people with that cultural capital, if that economic capital gets really, really high, and some of you are in majors where it's going to get really, really high, then that also plays into this as well because your passion and your cultural capital need to address the needs in the world. And that may be your calling as well. To say, okay, I have this job. It's made me very comfortable in my life. What can I do to bring freedom to captives? What can I do that other people can't because they don't have the same level of cultural capital and influence? What can I do to change the world for Jesus? The truth is, I'm not totally sure in every case that God particularly cares what you choose to do with your career. I think that God has given you every ingredient and then he says, this is the world. Go and fulfill this vision. And so some of us become engineers and some of us become teachers, some of us become nurses or doctors, some of us become lawyers. But you can fulfill that vision in any of those professions. You can do it in your personal life. You can do it in your public life. Being a Christian is about being part of a kingdom movement. It's not about advocating for a certain type of theology. It's not about digging your heels in on saying, I'm right and they're wrong. You know one of the things that, that just like burns me up inside? When Christians who are public Christians in, in, in the secular work world start to, to, to live against this value of bringing life to death, sight to the blind, and they, 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 instead of doing that, they start railing on all kinds of things. One of the key moments for me happened just a couple years ago. You probably heard about it. It was a bakery of all places. And a couple, same-sex couple, wanted this baker to give, uh, to, to make their, their cake. And I don't know if it was an advocate or activist or, or whatever. That's none of my business. I don't really know. But what I do know is that this couple came to a bakery, um, and it was apparently a pretty good bakery, and they said, hey, can we, you know, have a cake from you? And the baker 
said no. It's like, I get your reasoning for it based on your values and your beliefs, but is that it? Is that what it means to be a Christian in the work world? Because how is that bringing life to death? How is that bringing sight to the blind? Maybe the most Christian thing that we can do is to be in the world and to give them the best cake that we can possibly give. Maybe it's to be the best lawyer that someone can possibly have. Maybe it's to be the best accountant and to do the very best to our, of our ability because that is what Jesus has given us as, an equi- as our equipment. And that's what we're going to share with the world. A Christian, a Christian is going to enter into the world and do their absolute best to bring hope, to bring life, to bring levity and joy. Sometimes it means bringing a hard word. Boy, there's better ways to do that than a cake. So tonight I ask you the question. It's a simple question. What is this provoking in your heart? What is God saying to you right now about the future of your life? What are the things that break your heart? What are the opportunities that God has given to you? How does God want to use that? Your passion, your passion for his kingdom, your passion and concerns for the world, paired with your cultural capital, intersect with God's broken heart for a world that is in need. And he says to you, follow me and let's fish for people together. Let's pray together. God, 